Chapter 5. Ferocity Unloosed No one knew where Erethias came from. Some said they were the children of the great Erethias that carried the lanterns of the sun and the moon, and that they came down to the world as shooting stars when they were cubs. Some said they came from across the oceans, from islands near the edge of the world. No matter the belief in how Erethias came, each nation had their sacred place where the young cubs would appear after the old Erethia of their land had died. In Havamir, the receiving place was a glen ringed with tall trees in the middle of a wood. Monks had built a monastery nearby so they could wait for the arrival of new Erethias and then raise them until they were old enough to fly. When the Erethia Telephin died after a life of one hundred and forty-three years, Maris, a little girl then, came to the monastery to stay for the summer. Given that she was very young, she had an unusually keen interest in Havamir's traditions and wanted to be with the monks when the new Ariathea arrived. The monks told her that she could not wait at the tree-ringed glen to watch for the cubs' arrival because the cubs had never come when anyone was watching. The monks' story proved to be true, because every night that she stole away to the glen she came back tired and disappointed. It was only on the night she was caught and sent back to bed that the cub came. The monks had found him at the glen in the morning and took him to the monastery where they tied him up in the courtyard. When Morris saw him for the first time, he was alone, tugging at the heavy rope. She named the cub Hallerith, which meant pulls at the rope in the old Elamare language. She then freed him from where he was tied and he was loyal to her ever since. The arrow struck Hallerith in the shoulder and buried itself halfway up the shaft. Hallerith let out a roar so full of hurt that it pained those who heard it. The arrow's jagged point had torn at his muscle, and with every beat of his wings the arrow seemed to cut its way deeper and deeper into his shoulder. He bared and gritted his teeth as he made for the temple roof a wide surface for landing but then he felt a second stab of pain more excruciating than the first. The poison began to do its work, diving into the wound to burn and boil. Hallerith moaned and writhed so that he missed the roof and crashed through one of the temple's large stained glass windows. The Temple of Tyrion, a place for the worship of Ahatho and for the recognition of the Everin, had been built so that everyone who entered would be humbled by its vast architecture. The ceilings loomed stories and stories above so that the trespassing birds flew around as freely as they did outside. The massive pillars held up the roof like a forest of stone trees, and the sanctuary's length swallowed up voices before they reached the other side. It was a vast and silent place, a place of whispered prayers. But when Hallerith fell through the window and crashed to the floor, noise that had never before been heard inside the sanctuary destroyed the silence. Hallerith lay on his side in a ruin of broken glass, many of the pieces stuck in his sweat-soaked fur. So much like a shipwreck on a rocky shore did he seem, hull bent and cracked with open sails torn and plastered to the sand. Reeling from his crash, he groaned and growled where he laid. Then he remembered the arrow in his shoulder and made to remove it, but snap and snap as he would with his jaws. He could not catch the broken shaft, for his neck would not bend so far to his shoulder. The arrow was just out of reach. Defeated, Hallerith let his head drop to the ground and let his body remain still. Despite the twisting of his form with wings stretched out at odd angles, Hallerith had no desire to move from where he lay, for at last his body had found rest from his exertion and even some relief from his pain. His ribcage rose and fell as he felt the firmness of the floor beneath him, a promise for rest undisturbed. But then something happened that he did not understand. It came as another sharp jolt of pain that shook his entire frame, a jolt of pain that would have had him roar from the torment of it all, but breath had suddenly escaped him. His muscles began to twitch and jerk about. 
to here and there on the broken glass he writhed, and no position of his wounded form could bring him comfort or reprieve. Then his limbs, as if by separate wills, began working on their own, lifting him off the floor with great shudders. So began the change in Hallerith. No longer did he appear as a pitiful creature sprawled out in misery, but stood erect and mighty, his muscles swelling under his flesh, carved by a new, unnatural strength. So came his body moved and mastered by the poison that boiled within him, and Hallerith felt his mind was next besieged. Like an enemy's voice, the poison seemed to speak to him, demanding that he let a new rage rise. Then quickly came the memories, those that tempted anger, Solenon striking him in the race, the foul-smelling being of threat in the crowd. Back and back all the way to the rope that held him as a cub. Then the poison conjured an image, attacking Harrowth's very will to be Morris's protector. There came a horrible image to his mind, one of her being dragged into the woods by an unseen creature, of her being taken to their place by the river to be held under water and drowned. In his mind he saw her struggle in the shallows as she was murdered, and the water of the river turned the dark colour of poisoned tree sap. Finally Hallerith found his breath, and out of his mouth came a shaking roar that filled the city with his rage. Never could he let such a thing happen to his Maris. Her protection was all that mattered. All other laws and virtues he had once held would bow to that. Upon hearing the tone of sheer anger in Hallerith's roar, the multitudes in the amphitheatre filled with panic. People moved in all directions as they sought out ways to flee and find refuge. The soldiers tried to maintain order, but they too were wary of what an enraged Arethea might do. The maddened roars and bellows continued to resound from the temple, and the multitudes grew more and more fearful, fleeing the amphitheatre in panicked droves. Maris stood above it all on her balcony, hands shaking and eyes unblinking, colour drained from her skin. The anxious tumult of the crowds below did not move her. She stared and stared at the far-broken window through which Hallerith fell, yet she could not believe. "'Queen Maris, we need to leave,' Heron warned, but she made no sign of leaving. "'What has happened to you, Hallerith?' she whispered. What has happened to you? Heron then grabbed her hand and took her down the balcony steps where they entered the streaming crowds. Maris felt arms and shoulders roughly jostled her about as she held on to Heron's hand, but as they squeezed through the masses, her arm was stretched and their hands pulled away from one another. Maris reached out and called Heron's name, but no one took her hand. She was shoved off to the side and fell to the ground. Countless knees and shins knocked her about, and she saw her headdress knocked from her head and crushed to pieces by the stampeding feet. Through the feet and legs, Morris crawled to a nearby wall and pressed herself against it for protection. As she cowered there, she felt something leak into the corner of her eye. Her fingers touched her brow, and she drew them back to see that they had blood on them. It suddenly became hard for her to see as the blood stung her eye and tears blurred her vision. The sound of thumping feet started to dwindle, and Maris, blinking terribly, caught glimpses of the last people fleeing the amphitheatre. Following behind them, she began feeling her way along the wall and headed toward the sound of Hallerith's roars. "'She is here!' cried a nearby voice. The voice startled Maris, for she thought she had been alone. Forcing her eyes open, she saw that Mataro, the broken, stood before her. He was a half-dozen paces away, but would approach no further. His eyes did not meet hers, but looked down to the ground. Heron then came around a corner and ran to where they stood. "'Why do you leave her stumbling?' he asked, rebuking the man in tatters. "'I cannot take her hand,' replied Mataro submissively. Great shame would fall upon her if I did. Helen grunted at this reply. He took Maris by the arm and quickly led her out of the amphitheatre and on to a street. She looked back to see if Mataro was following them, but he was nowhere to be seen. Another roar came from the temple, and it echoed in the street where they ran. 
Heron took them into the protected confines of an alleyway and began checking each door they passed. Most of them were locked. Not until they were halfway down the alleyway did he find a back door to a stable left open. The stable was dark and the air was stuffy and still muffling the noise of distant roars. Bronteos and Gondas shifted nervously in their stalls and stamped their hooves. Heron led Meris inside and latched the door behind them. "'We will stay here until it is safe,' Heron said. He kept by the door and listened to the noises outside. Maris found one of the troughs in the stable and washed her face, cleaning the blood from her eye. Like Heron, she too listened to Halareth's roars and bellows coming from the temple. "'I need to go to him,' she said at length. "'You cannot go,' Heron replied, his eyes looking out of the chink in the door. "'Something drives him mad.' "'I will reason with him and calm him. "'He is beyond such counsel. "'You do not know him as I do, "'and you do not know what you are hearing. "'That is the cry of bloodlust, "'a cry I heard many times in battle, "'and those who made such a sound were not to be approached, "'even if they were your closest allies.' "'You may fear, but I will go on my own,' "'Maris said, her voice trembling. "'She went for the door, but Heron blocked her way. "'Let me pass!' she ordered. Heron turned his back on her and continued to look through the chink in the door. Bold defiance, she cried. I order you to let me pass. Morris grabbed a hold of his arm and tried pulling him away from the door, but it was of no use. She then started pounding her fists against his back with all her might. I can save him, she screamed. I can save him but no matter how much she yelled and hit, Heron could not be moved. The cloaked figure spied down from the top of the gargoyle where he perched. He saw that his poisoned arrow had done its work. With his task finished, he returned the bowstring and vial of poison to the pockets within his rags, but when he turned to leave, he found his way barred. Arcos stood but a few steps away on the gargoyle's shoulder, blocking the only way to the observatory. No one could have ascended the observatory tower that quickly, but there he stood, still as if he were a part of the tower, firm despite the wind whipping wildly about. Startled, the cloaked figure had to catch himself from falling back, and once he steadied himself, he slowly edged his way backwards on the gargoyle's giant snout while sizing up his opponent. The first thing he noticed was the knife gripped tightly in Arcos's right hand, but then he studied the eyes and sensed something deeper and more fearsome than the blade. "'I know of your kind!' The cloak figure growled from behind the mask. The thorn harbinger said that one of you would bring about the end of me. But how can you be what he says when I entered this city without your eye catching me? How can you be what he says when I shoot one of the flying beasts and you do nothing to prevent it? Even as I think now, I begin to doubt that you are a legend. Arcos flinched at the rebuke, if but a little. The cloaked figure reached for the dagger at his belt. Let us see, the cloaked figure asked, if the Thorn Harbinger really knew the truth. He charged at Arcos, dagger raised high, and Arcos held his hand out in front of him in response. For a moment, the cloaked figure thought he saw the ghost of a giant bird fly off the end of Arcos's arm and come straight for him. A blast of strong wind struck the cloaked figure full in the chest, and it was enough to knock him back. He slipped on the ice and slid off the gargoyle's head. Fingers clawing, he got a hold of the gargoyle's snout, and there he hung, body dangling over the city. Arcos peered down at the cloaked figure and into the strange yellow eyes that glared through the holes in the crude wooden mask. Defiance stared back at him. To the new world that comes after me! The cloak figure hissed, and with that he let go of the gargoyle's snout and fell out into nothing.
The area theatre's way Rossi and Solonon came to the temple and landed on the edge of the broken window. When they looked through the opening that Hallorath had made, they saw him on the temple floor doing battle with himself, shaking his head back and forth, rolling on the ground as if his skin had caught fire. In one moment he would run for the temple doors with a mad eye fixed on rending and tearing those who would hurt his Maris, but then in the next moment the bit of good sense that in him remained would halt that will and have his rebellious body stumble to the floor. All the while his throat would roar in despair and anger. Never had Weirossi and Solonon seen an Ereathea act in such a way, and they sensed that something had corrupted him. Weirossi called down to Hallorath in soothing bellows, asking for him to calm himself. Hallorath looked up to where they perched. He disregarded Weirossi, but had bared fangs for Solonon. She remembered the blow he had taken in the race. Indeed, a tinge of pain lingered on his jaw. Weirossi again called down for peace and reason, but Hallorath only snarled in reply, his ears folded back and the fur on his neck on end. Therefore, Weirossi turned to Solonon and bellowed somberly of what they would have to do. Hallorath would have to be subdued, even killed if they could not restrain him, for he was mad and too dangerous in his state. Solonon agreed. Hallorath may have been mad, but he understood what the two Erythaeas meant to do. His own kind would turn on him. Such a thought was enough to have the poison finish its work, even to overrun what little remained of his good sense. Like chaff in fire, his mind was then alight with rage. The two Erythaeas leapt through the window and descended upon Hallorath. With startling quickness, Hallowith took the statue of a saint in his mouth and hurled it through the air. The statue struck Solonon in the chest with such force that he fell to the ground in a heap. Hallowith then leapt through the air, caught Weirasi's forearm in his jaws, and threw the dark Ereithia across the room to where he crashed into an altar of burning candles. Weirasi rolled on the floor and howled in pain as he clutched his bloodied forearm to his chest. The joint of the shoulder was undone, and for the rest of Weirossi's life he would have a limp to remind him of that battle. Hallorith, standing over where Solonon lay in senselessness, prepared to tear out the golden Ereithia's throat, but something fell upon him and pinned him to the ground. The other Ereithias had entered in through the broken window, and Quenyol and Talagos had landed on Hallorith's neck and tail. A Sue alighted on the temple floor, but she was too afraid to approach the knot of wrestlers. Hallorith's eyes were too red with blood and rage, and she sensed that he could not be subdued. He threw himself with Quenyol and Talagos at the columns of the temple. Talagos was in her prime, with a strong back and sturdy limbs, and Quenyol had done battle with many beasts of the mountains. Yet the way Hallorith wildly struck the two of them against the columns made them look as if they were made of nothing more than cloth and stuffing. Again and again he swung them. Quenyol and Telagos held on as tightly as they could, digging their claws into Hallorith's flesh, enduring the pain that ran tremors down their spines. Hallorith, however, felt no pain. He did not tire or wince, for the poison had made him immune to weakness. Never had an Ereithea shown such strength or speed. It seemed as though time had slowed in Hallorith's eyes, so what he saw was the shape that blood took when it flew from his enemy's gashes and wounds. There was only so much agony Quenyol and Talagos could take, so they lost their hold of Hallorith and were thrown to the floor. Hallorith looked down on the limp forms of the Ereitheas, but the poison had broken his pity for them. Esu remained standing, but she was smaller than Hallorith and had seen what had happened to the others. She bolted for the temple doors in hopes of escape, but Hallorith caught her by the tail and pulled her back, her claws scratching uselessly at the floor. Hallorith threw her, as though she were a small stone, and she hurtled through the air and through the broken stained glass window, breaking more of it as she went. Shards of coloured grass rained down on the marketplace outside, and Asu crashed onto the steps of the library. Hallorith leapt through the broken window after her and came to the middle of the marketplace, crushing the merchant carts where he landed.
He turned on her with eyes that sought out something to rend and tear. Asu met those eyes and cried out in fear. While leaning over the edge of the gargoyle, and looking down to where the cloaked assassin had fallen to his death, Arcos heard the terrible howl of an Ereithea. It was different from the roars he heard before. It was the sound of another Ereithea, one in danger. And at the sound of it, something stirred inside Arcos. A riverbed in the desert can lay dry through the passage of many seasons, yet with one heavy rain torrents of water can come rushing down its dry trenches and swell at the banks. A cliff can mark the edge of land and sea for thousands of years, but with enough gnawing of the waves the cliff will crumble into the sea. Like the sudden and mighty acts of nature, unexpected forces began to work inside Arcos. His limbs became enlivened and his skin began to tingle. Something deep within him began to rise, an ancient, fearsome, wondrous thing. Therefore it seemed to him that his task had not ended with the fall of the cloaked assassin. Yet if he were to serve the Ereithea in danger, the steps leading down the tower would not bring him to her in time. So he did the only thing he knew to do. He jumped. Winds hissed past his ears, and the rooftops below that promised him death steadily grew bigger in his sight. He reached out his hands and began to craft the air around him. It was difficult to work with such matter since it was moving so quickly, but Arcos concentrated hard on his task and pushed away all the distraction of the doom that lay below him. It was then that a translucent material began forming itself around Arcos in the shape of a bird. Wings like cirrus clouds began beating along his sides, and wispy tail feathers followed in his wake. Just when he needed it to, his crafting of the wind came to life. A translucent Deogrin, a giant bird of prey made from crafted air, held Arcos within itself like a cape, and Arcos began to glide rather than fall. His creation soared with all the speed of the wind and took Arcos towards the danger. Asu attempted to crawl her way behind the library pillars for some form of protection, but in her battered state she could not escape. As Hallerith approached her, she could see more and more of the madness in him. His legs stepped in all directions at once as if they were fighting amongst themselves, and his head tilted to the sides so the foamy drool in his mouth spilled to the ground. The blood of the other Ereithias stained his mouth and fur, and Asu couldn't help but think about her own blood being shed. Hallerith drew closer, teeth bared and snarling, but then something hit him and made him tear his gaze away from her. A carving knife was stuck, hilt deep in his front paw. He looked down at it, quizzically, only to pull it out with his teeth and then spit it to the ground. When he turned to see who had thrown it at him, he saw Arcos standing alone in the marketplace. Without warning, Hallowith sprang at Arcos with a gaping maw of fangs. His teeth came crashing down with a force that could break a man in two, but Arcos dove to the side of the bite. Quickly bounding up Hallowith's wing, Arcos climbed onto the back where he was safe from the deadly fangs. Hallowith snarled, flapped his wings, and bucked in anger. His wing beats blew over the merchant carts and created a windstorm in the marketplace but Arcos took handfuls of the Ariathea's fur in his fists and clung on. Eventually, the wing beats became so powerful that Hallerith began to fly. Higher and higher he rose until most of the city could be seen below, and when he reached that height, he dove down from the sky straight for the rooftops. Hallerith pulled his head to his chest so that his back would receive the brunt of the impact with a large chimney. But before Arcos crashed into the brick, he jumped from Hallerith's back and tumbled down onto the roof. Hallerith made a sickening crack when he collided with the chimney, and he spun through the air and went crashing down into the street. Arcos, dusty and bruised, hung on the eaves by his fingers. He looked down at Hallerith lying motionless on the street below. 
It appeared that the Erythia had broken his neck with such an impact, and that he would rise no more. But the poison would not let the Erythia die. Only it could kill him now. Without a groan of half of pain, Halloweth got to his feet, and immediately hunted for Arcos with his eyes. There he saw Arcos pulling himself up over the eaves to run the rooftops to head toward the gardens. Too narrow were the streets for his wings to open, so Halloweth did not fly, but pursued Arcos by foot, ploughing through a cart of timber wine and loosing a flood of scarlet down the street. Arcos jumped from roof to roof and nimbly manoeuvred his way around the chimney pots. He made sure that Halloweth followed close behind. When he reached the last roof before the gardens, he leapt from its eaves and into an orchard of tansy fruit. Leaves and branches broke as he fell through them, and he landed on the lawn with a soft thud. Through the rows of tree trunks, Arco spied Halloweth charge into the gardens from the street. The Ariathea uprooted the tansy trees and tossed them aside as if they were no more than weeds. With space enough to open his wings, he flew up to where he could see Arcos running through the orchards. The walls of the city lay a good distance ahead of Arcos, but he ran as fast as a gander in full gallop. With a score of long strides, he made it through the tansy fruit trees and entered into the kudan trees. Just beyond them lay the road that led to the city gate. Arcos pushed branches aside as he ran and squashed fallen fruit with his feet, nearly slipping on the orange pulp. A large shadow then began to cover him. Only when Arcos could feel the mighty gust of wind that Halloweth brought did he dive off to the side and hit the ground. Just above Arcos's head, Halloweth's jaws snapped shut but closed down on nothing. As he flew by, he dragged his tail along the ground, ploughing the earth as he went. Arcos would have been crushed at the bottom of a freshly cut trench had he not quickly rolled out of the way. When Halloweth passed, Arcos picked himself up off the ground and kept running. Soon the cobblestone of the road that led toward the city gate pounded under his feet. As Arcos ran, he took the blue stone from the pouch on his belt and began speaking to it, giving it instructions. Do not break him, he told the stone lastly, and when Arcos reached the archway of the open gate, he quickly found a crack in the mortar and jammed the stone inside. With the stone in its place, Arcos went through the archway to the outside of the city and waited for Halloweth to come. The stone left in the wall began to rattle in its place as if the land were quaking. At first it rattled by itself, but then the shaking spread to the other stones, big stones and little stones alike. Soon the whole gateway began to shift and change as if it had taken on a life of its own. The doors buckled on their hinges, and it seemed that the whole section of the wall would collapse, but it held together. From a distance, Arcos conducted the movements of the stones and mortar with the unseen guidance he possessed in the movements of his hands. Then came Hollerith, sweeping down from the heights and heading straight for Arcos, rage fueling his speed. Arcos held his ground even in the terrible moment right before the fangs and claws would be upon him. There was a great rumble that shook the city walls and a crash that made an explosion of dust fill the air. Then all became suddenly quiet. No claws had torn into Arcos, and no fangs had bloodied his flesh. He stood quite whole on the road outside of the city gate. The stones on the top archway had become like teeth, and the cobblestones on the road below did the same. The gateway had been shaped into something like that of a mouth of a giant beast, and it had closed down on Hallerith as he tried to fly through. The stone jaws held fast to him. They could have crushed his neck with ease, but the stone Arcos had put in the wall had honoured the request not to break the Ariathea. Halloweth's head and neck stuck out from between the stone teeth, and even though he was pinned there, he still tried to lunge at Arcos. A wall made of any other stone would have perhaps given way to Halloweth's unnatural strength, but the stones in the mortar were made of earth marrow and would not move.' 
His throat growled angrily, and his fangs snapped at his foe as Arcos stood a safe distance away. Arcos paced back and forth and explored Harrowith's eyes with his own. Their vessels had cracked and bled the whites into red, and showed Arcos that he could do nothing. He knew the poison had gone too far. Arcos kicked the nearest stone he could find with all his frustration, and in the same motion he let himself fall cross-legged on the ground. Sitting just a few paces from Hallerith, Arcos bowed his head and waited. It did not take long for the poison to end its work. Eventually, Hallerith stopped trying to lunge at Arcos, and the red in his eyes clouded over. In the last moments, a peaceful calm overcame the Ereithia, as if he were going to sleep. He lay his head down on the road and closed his eyes. <laughs>